Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sue Black and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Engagement at Lancaster University. I am delighted to be the host for tonight's public lecture and I'd like to extend a very warm welcome indeed to all of you. Our public lecture series is an important part of the university's engagement with different communities, and we aim to host lectures that are meaningful, relevant, and above all, interesting and thought provoking. And tonight I know will be one of those gems. The last year has been a trying time for our communities, both locally and further afield. And tonight's lecture is the third in this academic year series, and it's my pleasure to welcome you as we look to navigate and understand the strange new world in which we live. Tonight, we're joined by Professor, Professor Rachel Isba, Professor of Medicine at Lancaster Medical School, Professor Linda Woodhead, who's the Distinguished Professor of Religion and Society, and Dr. Claire Hardy, who is a lecturer in organizational health and well-being. During this lecture, they will explore how the pandemic has affected the oncology workforce and their well-being, the hidden impact on child health, and how the NHS has emerged as a quasi-religion. These three talks all represent different ways in which the NHS is being utilised and perceived as a result of the pandemic. And we hope that the lecture overall gives you a flavour of different areas of research taking place at Lancaster, which explores the common theme of new perspectives on the NHS. I wish you all a very enjoyable evening and I'm pleased, first of all, to hand over to Professor Rachel Isba. Rachel. So thank you very much for coming. Just to briefly introduce myself, uh, as Sue says, I am Professor of Medicine in the Medical School. Uh, I'm also Associate Dean for Engagement in the Faculty of Health and Medicine. But I also have another job uh, where I'm a consultant in paediatric public health medicine uh, in an emergency department. And I'm going to talk about some of the work um, that's arisen out of my NHS time, um, but I've used uh, my university approach of research to address. So this is just a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, as Sue mentioned, there are various ways to submit questions. Um, and I will say that any question about uh, human uh, behavior and toilet roll buying will be filtered out by the moderators, uh, as I can't help explain that, I'm afraid. But I am going to talk about children's emergency department attendances, and then a bit more about the wider impact, uh, mostly indirect, of the pandemic on children and young people. So I did none of this on my own. Uh, I'm here. Uh, I wish I wasn't here on my own, but here I am. Uh, but I want to tell you about some other people that have contributed to this work, some of whom are in this virtual audience. So I have colleagues from the university, but also various hospitals around Manchester and uh, around the UK and then around the world. And I'll tell you a little bit more about my colleagues in Yale uh, in a minute. So I could have done none of this on my own. So just a little bit about my other day job. So these pictures just map the pandemic for me, really. So that first shot is from September 2019. We were all oblivious of what was going to come. And that's me in my emergency department, where I was seeing patients as part of a pilot study, looking at embedding public health approaches in routine um, paediatric emergency department attendances. Uh, March the 6th, we were starting to get the feeling that something was coming our way. So that picture there is me getting fitted for my specialist uh, PPE mask. Um, so that tube that I'm holding at the bottom uh, sucks all the air out of the mask and then blows it out to make sure the mask fits, um, fits your face properly. I have the dubious pleasure of having the highest score on that uh, in my emergency department. Um, so the face chin combo has finally paid off. March the 13th, the pandemic had been declared, uh, and that's me again in the emergency department. I had to pull an all-nighter because the advice from Public Health England and other bodies about how to manage these patients, particularly the children, was changing so often. I think the advice changed three times during that day. So I had to um, stay in the hospital till we had a pathway that we could use to manage anybody that came in over the weekend. And then that final picture, uh, is uh, shows that as of June, any place in the corridor in the hospital on the way from the car park, we've had to wear a mask. So um, that's the standard mask. And then I change it to one of the blue ones when I go onto the shop floor. Um, and mercifully, I've not had to wear uh, one of those full PPE masks for reasons that I'll now explain to you. 
So this is just a little bit of background about the pandemic. We were due a big one. We were expecting it to be influenza, to be fair. We weren't expecting a coronavirus pandemic, but we were due one because it'd been a hundred years since the last big one. And if we think all the way back to this time last year, which in some respects feels like a lifetime away, the first cases in the UK were back in January, 2020. And it was around this time, um, a little bit later that we had the first death uh, in the UK. My hospital has a regional infectious diseases unit. So we actually had patients very early on in the pandemic. Uh, and it was very interesting to be on the inside of that and also read what was going on in the media. So we'll all remember that Wednesday, March the 11th was the day the pandemic was declared. And we went into lockdown on the 23rd. And that was in the UK, but also in Connecticut uh, in the States. And that's important because that's where Yale is. And I'll talk a little bit about their findings uh, in regards to the pandemic in a minute. So during um, Boris Johnson's um, press conference on Monday the 16th of March, uh, my little boy developed a cough uh, and I looked at him as he coughed and his cough appeared to be continuous. So at the time, the guidance was anybody with a continuous cough had to isolate for two weeks with their entire household. There was no testing. They definitely weren't testing children and you could only get a test if you were admitted to hospital. So if you're pretty poorly with COVID. So on the 16th of March, uh, we went into our house and on the 30th of March, I came back out of the house again after two weeks and I went to work on the 31st and I looked around and I wondered where on earth all of the children had gone because we were seeing fewer children when I went in because the pandemic had started. But by the time I came out, we were down to single figure children numbers some days in the department, whereas you were used to seeing between 40, uh, 40 to 80 children a day. So that made me think, so what about the impact of the pandemic on children? Fortunately, we all know now, although we didn't know at the beginning of the pandemic, that children are relatively spared um, the effects of the pandemic in terms of their direct effects. However, I'm going to show that the indirect impacts on them of every single aspect of their lives have been, to be honest, fairly catastrophic. I would challenge you to find a single way that children and young people haven't been negatively impacted by the pandemic uh, indirectly. So thinking back to when I came back to work on the 31st of March and noticed there weren't any children. Um, so I decided to have a look and see well, how many children were we missing? So this was in the first wave. It was immediately after the beginning of lockdown. And so I looked to see just the numbers, how many children had come to my hospital. So that's the DGH on this graph and how many were coming to the children's hospital in Manchester. So that's CH on this graph. Now there's two very interesting things I think. Um, the first is that the bars are almost exactly the same. So these are the numbers, the percentage fewer children we saw immediately following the pandemic compared to the same time last year. And the other thing is, if you look when lockdown started and you think back to that press conference on the 16th of March or back to the pandemic being declared on the 11th of March, that's when the patients started to disappear. And as I say, if you look down the bottom, we were seeing 30% of the children we'd normally see, uh, which is quite astounding and something that none of us had ever seen before or expected. So because I'm nosy, I wanted to know if this was just our experience and we were actually amongst the first to publish globally on this phenomenon. So I got in contact with a colleague at Yale where I have a visiting appointment and I wanted to know if they were seeing the same thing. So these graphs, um, the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital is on the one on the left and Yale New Haven Children's Hospital is the one on the right. But actually they are so similar that you could probably swap the labels around and you wouldn't be terribly far off. So it's quite astounding to me that despite completely different populations, different countries, different healthcare systems, um, we saw the same pattern pretty much uh, of attendances just completely evaporating after lockdown. We also discovered that children and young people that did go to the emergency department were up to 60% more likely to be admitted. Now that might be um, because only the ones that needed to be admitted were going to the hospital, or it might be that some of the ones that were coming to the hospital were more poorly by the time they arrived and therefore more likely to be admitted to the hospital. Uh, and again, we saw the same thing uh, in Manchester and in Yale. So that told us that something was definitely going on. But why? Um, 
And I'm sure I asked that a lot when I was a kid and my children asked that of me. And I always encourage the students to ask it. And in this case, there's probably lots of different reasons for it. So the pandemic will have knocked on the head some other diseases that we would normally see. So for example, we've had far few children with other respiratory illnesses, uh, lots less diarrhea and vomiting, um, and lots of less of things that are caused by viruses because children can wash their hands, there's lots of social distancing, people aren't mixing as much. And at the time for that first lockdown, all nurseries were shut, schools were shut, uh, everything was closed. So people were coming into contact with each other a lot less. So that was probably part of it. But actually, there was this other bit. People were scared to go to the hospital or they didn't know uh, the hospital was still open. Uh, there was some miscommunication around how disrupted services were. And then also this decrease in medically unnecessary attendances. So these are perhaps children that didn't need to come to the hospital for a medical reason, but have come for another reason, which is really very valid. And we pick up a lot of things in the emergency department, aside from the reason that children are here. So we weren't seeing these children that were, say, coming in um, with constipation, for example, classic example, but we might be able to have a conversation with them normally whilst they were there and discover that perhaps um, there was uh, an issue with housing or they were at risk of abuse, uh, all these other things that we can pick up routinely during a consultation. So this got me worried that the, with these children were basically invisible. So they were coming late with things that could be treated or they were invisible. So they were at higher risk of, of us not picking up on abuse and things like that. And there is thankfully some emerging evidence from elsewhere that the children weren't desperately sick when they were coming. But there are some specific groups of children who were perhaps presenting later than they would have done if it wasn't a pandemic. And I use the example of brain tumours there um, uh, because brain tumours are not affected by whether or not you're washing your hands. Brain tumours will occur regardless of whether in, we're in a pandemic. And I thought that was something that was really important to look at. So I got in touch with a friend I went to medical school with who's a brain surgeon down in Cambridge. And um, he sent me these data. So they're quite interesting. The referrals went down in the first half of the year, but actually in March, referrals went down by nearly a third. So some of those referrals wouldn't have been happening. So children were staying indoors. They weren't falling out of trees and landing on their heads. Um, they weren't getting uh, involved in motor vehicle collisions as much. But again, the brain tumours will continue uh, to occur. And actually, we saw a decrease in brain tumour referrals compared to average and an increase in head injuries, uh, which might have reflected the um, circumstances in which people found themselves in that first lockdown. And it's also interesting to note the picture on the right hand side. So the calls to the specialist nurse line went up a lot at the very beginning. So they had more calls in the first half of 2020 than they'd had in all of 2019. And that reflects the fact that people were worried. So these were people that were known to the um, neurosurgical services, but were phoning for advice. And again, I'll remind you that early on, we had no idea that children weren't going to get really, really poorly uh, and die in the same, um, same numbers um, that perhaps older populations have. So that was very interesting as well. And that led to popping in a, a research grant in the summer to look at this in um, uh, some more detail. So this is my good news bit of the presentation that we just got funded for two years uh, to look at this phenomenon of brain tumours uh, in the pandemic. So uh, there's some anecdotal evidence that children came late, sometimes with catastrophic consequences. But more importantly, we wanted to know what happened for the children's perspective during the pandemic uh, and this massive disruption to their normal lives, but also the health service. Um, I, I don't think I've ever worked in such an exciting group of people. You don't often get brain surgeons working with social scientists and public health doctors. So this is very exciting um, and it's a two year project and we're hoping it'll make a real difference to the children and young people that are affected, but also help us learn um, just in case we have periods of disruption to the health service uh, in the future. But you'll remember at the beginning, I talked about the wider impact of the pandemic on children's health. So I've talked about the very medical stuff, the stuff that comes to hospital. And, but I also said you'd struggle to find anything that hasn't been negatively affected for children during the pandemic. So I've just chosen two examples, which for me are quite striking. So that bar chart, the data are from September. So by September, children's schooling had been disrupted for six months. 
but that six months included a summer holiday. And if you look at the graph, you'll see that the children that are living in the most deprived areas of England had lost all six months of schooling. So they, it was as if their school, they'd not been to school at all, and then some. So that doesn't take into account the summer holiday. So um, it had been six months minus six weeks that school had been disrupted, but they'd lost the full six months. And that is only, I'm guessing, going to have got worse since that time, um, since the schools have, have gone into another period of being shut. And it's very difficult to balance um, public health measures with keeping schools open, but these children are massively disadvantaged as a result of that. And if you look on the map, you will not be surprised to know that areas of the Northwest uh, are amongst some of the worst effective, affected, sorry, when it's looking at um, employment and the recovery from COVID. So we're not even at a recovery stage yet. Uh, and already it's showing that children in the northwest and some other areas around the UK are going to be very badly affected by this as their parents are very badly affected and that in turn uh, has an impact uh, on what's going on at home. These are just two examples. Uh, I would encourage you to look at the MOM review for COVID-19 as there are so many other examples in there. So just to conclude, as I've said, children and young people are mercifully relatively spared um, by the direct effects of the pandemic. But I think you'd struggle to make an argument that this pandemic has affected people equally. Uh, it's been sexist, it's been racist, and it's been ageist. And children and young people are one of the groups that have been particularly badly affected by the pandemic. And they're gonna to have to live with the consequences for a lot longer than the rest of us. So that's why I'm, I'm particularly interested on these, uh, on these indirect impacts of the pandemic and the fact that these children have been largely invisible for big bits of the pandemic. So um, you know how to post a question and not about toilet roll. And at the end of a consultation, I always ask the child that I've seen, do they have any questions? And you can always rely on children to ask really tough questions. They once asked me how far away the moon was um, and I had to say that I didn't know. But one of the one of my favourite questions is where does Father Christmas go for the rest of the year? And one of the positives that came out of the first lockdown is that I can tell you he happily drives a rubbish truck uh, in Manchester. So um, thank you very much uh, for listening. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you, Rachel. And I knew you are, you always have the answer to the most difficult questions. <laughs> that, was, that was a really thought provoking uh, presentation. I was aware of some of the work that you've done, but to, to actually see it in that format was, was really incredibly sobering. We will come back to you, I'm sure, with some questions, um, but I'm going to ask Dr. Claire Hardy now if she would like to, to take over the baton and move to the next phase of, of this relay. Claire. Thank you. Okay, well, my name is Claire Hardy and I'm working on the COVID Now project, which is looking at oncology, workforce, well-being and work during COVID-19. So you may have seen various headlines about the impact of COVID-19 that it's having on the public, the delays to people's diagnoses, to their treatment, and in some headlines, people's life expectancy as well. But the effect on oncologists and their health and well-being has also been recognised and receiving lots of attention. And what some of this work is highlighting is that firstly, staff well-being and burnout is something that needs to be looked at and addressed but also that there seems to be differences, understandably, across different countries and staff are having different experiences. So it's quite important for us to look at a particular country in depth at their oncology workforce. And whilst previous work has focused on medical oncologists, which is a key group in cancer care delivery, it's important to include other health professionals and occupations that play a role in that delivery of cancer care too. So that's what we're doing in this particular project called COVID Now. So just to tell you about who we are, again, I'm not alone in this. So COVID Now, it's a 12 month project, research project, and it's based in the UK. It's being led by Dr. Susanna Banerjee from the Royal Marsden NHS Trust, and it's funded by the Royal Marsden Cancer Charity through a very kind donation from the Lady Garden Foundation. 
and the project is a multidisciplinary team across several institutions and Lancaster University is the academic institution involved in the project. Uh, that involves myself um, as a co-investigator and Eleanor Thorne who is our researcher on the study here in Lancaster. And the main objective of the project is to try and understand the experiences of UK NHS staff, uh, employees working in oncology departments and services during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in particular, we're trying to examine levels of well-being um, and key work, work outcomes of interest. We're also trying to understand what factors might contribute to these experiences and to these outcomes and what efforts could be offered to support uh, a healthy and productive workforce for COVID, um, but also beyond COVID as well. So we are collecting data from across the NHS oncology staff, uh, medical and non-medical staff at different time points. Uh, during COVID-19. Namely, we're collecting data just after the peaks of waves of COVID. We're using online surveys and interviews to gather the data and the surveys are looking at various different aspects. Um, so we're looking at staff their backgrounds, their health, uh, their lifestyles, their approaches to coping, the resources that they're drawing on during COVID, um, as well as aspects related to their work and their job, so their duties and their working environment. And we're particularly interested in the well-being and work outcomes, as I mentioned. So we're gathering data on um, well-being using the World Health Organization's measure of well-being, which looks at psychological distress specifically. Um, we're looking at burnout, we're looking at workability and we're looking at levels of work engagement too. And we were very conscious that we didn't want to have a very long survey to give to staff in the NHS. It's really difficult to get surveys completed anyway in research, but particularly this group because of the pressures that we knew staff were under. So we very much tried to keep the survey uh, to a minimum in duration and its length, I think, the first survey was about 20 minutes max. It could have been less than that, actually, um, just so that we could try and encourage a good response rate to that particular survey. But for although it was quite a short survey in length, it was quite comprehensive and it did cover lots of different factors. Um, and the team did spend quite a lot of time working on this. But in addition to the surveys, at the same time, we also conducted interviews as well, which we did virtually. And we were asking questions to try and understand and actually hear the voices of staff experiences and their perceptions of their work changes, um, the possible changes and impact that COVID might be having on their health and well-being, how they're coping with COVID-19, but also what they feel like they would like or what they think would be helpful to support NHS oncology staff during COVID. Now, so far, we've done one round of data collection and we've started doing the preliminary analysis on that data. The second round of data collection is actually happening this month. So this is a perfectly timed uh, talk. Um, so that is kind of where we've got to on the project. But for the rest of my time during the talk, what I thought I'd do is just share some of the information and some of the data that we're finding in the study so far. We have a lot more data, which we are going to share. Um, but just for today, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a flavor of what some of the things are starting to come out in the data that we've collecting. So the first survey went out last summer um, and it went really well. We had over a thousand NHS staff responding from across the UK, but it was primarily in the Northwest, London and the South East. And we had a variety of different occupational groups take part. So we had um, nurses, pharmacy staff, 
other allied health professionals like dietitians, for example, and also support services as well, like managers and administrative support professionals, all of whom contribute to the delivery of cancer care in the NHS. Um, most worked in specialist cancer centres and had been working in oncology for um, about an average of, of 12 years. So they were quite experienced uh, group in terms of working in the NHS and oncology. Now, from the survey, what we found is that probably quite unsurprisingly, COVID-19 has uh, impacted on our staff in a number of ways. And most commonly, that was quite a big increase in the amount of electronic communications that were happening, telephone consultations, um, lots more meetings um, that were happening using videos, but also changes in work patterns and shifts too. And um, Quite a, quite a big group had experienced increases in their administrative work too. Around about a third of those who responded to the survey said that their primary role had changed through COVID, um, although quite a, a low amount of people had actually been completely redeployed at that time when we collected the data. Um, so PPE, it's usually quite a an, an interesting area to explore. Um, what we found is at the time of the survey, around about half had been fit tested for PPE. Um, so only half, um, but actually the majority felt that they did have sufficient PPE to do their job with around about two thirds felt that they could carry out their job without compromising their personal safety. Um, and the interviews that we gathered at the same time kind of reflected those findings from the survey. So staff were discussing the changes in their roles that they'd experienced, the increases in demands um, in their workload for most people. And there were also comments around um, changes due to safety issues, additional safety requirements, all the cleaning that needed to be done, and also the changes in the policies and the procedures uh, that were continuously being brought in and needed to be performed by all staff. And so I wanted to share just a couple of quotes with you from the interviews just to highlight some of the changes in the work and the increased uh, work demands that people were experiencing. So the first one here, one person said, you can constantly bombarded with changing rules, regulations and guidelines and trying to keep up with all that can be and trying to keep up with that can be really overwhelming at times. It just feels like everybody has got something to say about everything. And actually, the people on the ground are the ones who have to try and deal with all of that. And then the second quote here is, so on a day to day basis, it's become incredibly busy. We were already quite bu a busy unit, but actually things have just increased sort of tenfold. There may have been there have been so many amendments for a lot of our studies. So our workload has just increased massively, which has really put pressure on all of us to enable that we get all of these changes implemented as soon as possible. So people in the interviews were saying that they were trying to do what they were being told to do, um, but people were mentioning how difficult it was, often because guidance was just constantly changing so regularly and there was a lot of uncertainty about that and when it was happening. So that was placing additional pressure on staff. And for those delivering direct patient treatment and care, what we found from the survey is that almost all felt that patient management had been altered in some way because of COVID. And the majority believed that although it should be the same as before COVID, there was only around a third that felt able to be able to deliver the same standard of care. And then around two thirds uh, felt that there would be some impact or uh, has been some impact on the survival and quality of life of patients because of the changes in treatments that had occurred because of COVID. But two of the areas that we were interested in uh, were experiences of well-being and burnout on NHS staff. And we found that over 40% of the staff that responded were actually perceiving themselves to be having quite poor well-being um, or high psychological distress to the point at which they may actually be considered at risk of depression. 
and some staff occupations did appear to be experiencing poorer well-being compared to some of the others in particular around half of the support staff and pharmacy staff appeared to be at risk of depression uh, with doctors and nurses actually showing the lowest levels of at risk in terms of their well-being but then for burnout, when we looked at this, um, burnout meaning feeling exhausted, just over a third of NHS staff were indicating that they were experiencing burnout. And there were slight differences between occupations. The highest rates, again, were in pharmacy staff, uh, but this time doctors also showed the highest rates of burnout too. Um, but to not be too negative about it, if you want to take a positive perspective, what that's showing also is that around about two thirds of staff were not at risk or they weren't experiencing burnout at the time of that survey. So I guess we'll see um, if this is the same in the next survey, which we will be looking at again uh, very, very soon. Now turning to workability, so staff were asked to rate how their current performance compared to their lifetime best and what we found was that on average staff rated themselves about on averages of 7 out of 10, 10 being the best that it's ever been. So it suggested that despite working in the throes of COVID, staff still felt able to do their work, albeit not at their best. Um, but still able to do it quite well, which I think is quite an encouraging result. We were also interested in engagement as well. So engagement is someone experiencing a positive, fulfilling work related state of mind. So it's typically characterized by um, experiencing vigor and dedication and being really absorbed in your work. And we know from previous research in the field of occupational health and well-being, that engagement is, is quite an important thing to look at because it can help well-being and work outcomes, but it can also act as a buffer to burnout as well. So we looked at it in our study and what we found is that some professional groups do appear to be experiencing kind of significantly higher or lower engagement than some of the other occupations. So nurses and doctors actually showed the highest levels of engagement in their work, but again, pharmacy staff support services staff showed the lowest. Um, so what's quite interesting is that, you know, different groups might be experiencing different levels of well-being, engagement, but they don't necessarily mean that they will be burnt out or they'll have impaired workability. Um, there are lots of factors that might contribute to that, um, such as the particular personal approaches or coping that staff might be using to, to help them navigate COVID-19. Their working environment as well can also be playing a part. We've collected data on those different areas and we're analysing them as part of the project to just to try and see what are the key factors that might be able to predict um, well-being and burnout, engagement and workability in this particular population of the NHS. But I just wanted to say that it's not all doom and gloom. Um, some interviews were highlighting that it's not all bad and some good has happened through working through COVID. So I've got a couple of quotes here. So the first one, uh, we had one person say, um, and probably the best thing that's come out of it, I think, is that Whole, the whole sort of unity at work and everybody coming together as a team and working together a team just you know standing together and going right how are we going to face this and just getting on with it I found quite inspirational so staff were saying that support from work their colleagues and their team has been really good for them it's been really helpful for them working through COVID but also interestingly what's coming through as well is that NHS staff are saying that they felt particularly valued by the public and that has been really helpful. So the second quote here on the slide says, I know some of it came out of not necessarily the government, but clap for carers. I think the impact of that was massive. I just remember the first couple of times that happened, just being so overwhelmed. And, you know, those sort of things uh, that are quite small actually make a big difference. But those sort of things don't necessarily come from the government they come from people. So that's supported by other things. So that really, you know, um, you know how much you're valued. So that was a really nice quote I felt about staff in the NHS just being really valued by uh, the public. And if you don't know what 
clap for carers is. Uh, there was something that happened, which I think may have started again now, where every week people would go out at a certain point in time uh, and they would clap um, essentially for NHS staff workers just to show their support for what they were doing during the pandemic. Um, so that is just a snapshot of, of what we've been doing so far. Um, and just to tell you what's happening next. So um, we are collecting the next round of data this month. So um, eh, spread the word. Uh, I think it's quite good timing about doing this talk. If you know anyone who works for the NHS who is involved in cancer and oncology services, just let them know about the research and that a survey is going out and they can take part. We'd love to hear from them, the more the merrier. Um, what we're going to be doing after we gather all that data is we're going to be comparing it to survey one to see if anything uh, has changed at all. Um, we've actually also included some additional questions as well in the second survey. So things about vaccines as well, that I think is going to be really interesting to look at. But then what we're going to be doing with this project is sharing what we find. We're going to share it with as many people, groups, hospitals and stakeholders, as many as we can. Um, we, we, we think still that this is the current uh, largest piece of work that's specifically examining this part of the NHS workforce during COVID. And so what we aim to do is to try and produce recommendations based on our evidence to try and help cancer care staff, help hospitals and policy makers so that they can help the NHS and ultimately the patients that need their cancer care. So just to say thank you to everybody and I will stop it there and let the next speaker come in. Thank you for listening. Thank you very, very much indeed, Claire. And a very sobering time, but really nice to hear some green shoots with, with a little bit of good news. And, uh, you know, let's face it, sometimes that's in very short supply. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, to our last speaker of the evening, to Professor Linda Woodhead. And thank you very much for spending some of your evening with us. I'm a sociologist and I'm interested in religion and values and culture and what really matters to people. And so I'm going to be approaching the topic of the NHS from, from that point of view. And I'm going to be arguing that it's a, a quasi religion or it's actually something that's very sacred to us. And we need to think about this aspect of things when we think about the NHS. The interesting thing about, and there are some very regular and good surveys of people's attitudes to the NHS, um, the King's Fund, uh, is, a, is, a, is a wonderful um, research body that looks at this topic regularly and the anniversary in 2018 of the NHS led to a whole set of new analysis. And you can see here just how satisfied people are with the NHS on the whole and that it generally is going up. Uh, that's the, the sort of mauve line on the top. It's not completely uniform. If you look at different parts of health and social care, you'll see that the levels of satisfaction are a bit different for each one. So the uh, satisfied here is the, is the dark purple. And you can see that people are very satisfied with outpatient service and general practice, but less satisfied um, with, or least satisfied with social, social care, perhaps not surprisingly, where there's actually quite a lot of dissatisfaction. And that was in 2019. But uh, we've just heard about um, the outpouring of public support that there was in the first lockdown. Of course, it, it, it is called clap for carers. And carers is a broad term. It's not just the NHS. Uh, and uh, it was interesting just seeing there the pharmacists seeing that as a validation. So not just the NHS, but uh, wide support. And people actually go to real extremes on this. Uh, I've wandered around a lot. I'm up in Glasgow at the moment for the lockdowns and uh, it's really common to see in people's windows and gardens and displays some symbol, something about the NHS, a rainbow, um, often pictures and, and uh, little displays that children have made. And uh, I'm quite surprised by just how common that is. Here's someone who's really gone to town in painting their, their whole house, and it's not the only one. Uh, 
So this, this suggests you know, a level of popular support uh, that's really quite extraordinary. We're also, you know, you might say, well, that's just sentiment, but do we really mean it? Well, if money is a sacrament of seriousness, yes, we do mean it, because the amount we spend on the NHS has been going up and up. It's been going up in real terms since the NHS was founded in, uh, in 1948, and it's also gone up as a proportion of public service budget. And you can see that here, comparing the 1950s and then 2016-17. So it's a much bigger pot, bit of a pot, than it used to be. And when you ask people um, if they're happy with that and what they'd like to see their taxes spent on, this, this is in accordance with what people want it spent on. When you ask people that back in the 50s, um, many more people thought that you should have a lot more spending on things like housing. Today, all the other competing things get less priority than the health service. So it's not just that we spend more, it's that when we're asked what we want to spend on, that's how we want our taxes to be spent. Here's the real term growth since the NHS was founded. Um, and you can see how very, very significant that growth has been. So we are attached to the NHS in this country emotionally but also um, we're happy to reach into our pockets and um, make that count. And just that, you know, the iconography shows our devotion to the NHS, badges like this. And of course, the famous slogan um, uh, under the COVID emergency and protect the NHS is the centerpiece. I and mean, if you look at this, it literally is the centerpiece. It's in bigger font and it's the central message because it's the reason, it's the sacred thing here. Why should we stay home? Because we want to protect the NHS. I mean, some people actually criticised that and said, no, the most important thing is we want to save lives. We're fetishising the NHS and making the NHS seem more important than, than saving lives. Well, it's very revealing that that's the message that I'm sure there are lots of, somebody who's paid a lot of money to do this and probably do some focus groups and research. But the thing that we really care about is the NHS and that's in bold here. Um, so why is this? You know, why do we in this country feel so strongly about our health service in such a positive way? And it isn't the case in all other countries with developed healthcare systems. We have a very unusual amount of uh, affection and, and, and even devotion to the NHS here. That's the question that I want to answer in the remaining time I've got. Now here, the existing surveys don't really help us a lot because I think the questions are a bit limited. They're not very imaginative. So here the King's Fund asked in 2019, a series of questions, but the thing about surveys, which I do, I'm just as guilty, I'm a sociologist and do lots of survey work, um, but people, that these are closed questions. So you get a range of options, but the options are given you. So they don't necessarily reflect what people's real feelings or reasons are unless you get those questions really just spot on and do a lot of testing to do that. So here the questions are about um, um, things like the quality of the care, that it's free, good range of services, attitudes of the staff, don't have to wait long, um, you know, money well spent, those sorts of things. And they get at something, um, but I don't think they really can explain, well they can't, they can't, this can't explain why the level of devotion that I've just been illustrating. Let me go to a very famous sociologist to help us think about the reasons, and this is Max Weber, and he made what I think is still a really useful distinction, and it's between two sorts of reasoning that human beings do. He called the first one instrumental rationality, and that's where we're thinking about means and ends. So we're rational because we're using the right means to achieve some, some end. We're using the most effective one. And we often say, well, that's reasonable that he did that because we can see why. But Weber pointed out that that is by no means the only way that we reason. We don't just think about what's effective and about our own interests. 
We also have what he called value rationality. And a lot of our behavior is motivated by our deepest values. In fact, sometimes we will act for values against our own self-interest and certainly against our own economic self-interest. And if you, need, if you want to understand people and you want to understand social institutions, you need to see what values do they embody? Um, in what ways, if at all, are they sacred? My argument is that the reason the NHS gets so much support from us in this country is because it is a symbol and repository of some of our most sacred values. Now, which values and how did it get to be like this and was it always like this? I want us to think back a bit before we had the National Health Service. Now, people weren't just you know, dying in the streets and totally uncared for. There was a very well-developed health service already, but of a, of a, of a different and, and, and more varied kind. And the big players in it were religious institutions who'd been, you know, hospitals, of course, are a Christian creation. They'd been created uh, in the West from medieval times onwards. This is actually a picture from Denmark, but I love it. It's kind of, it's so artistic and uh, um, well posed, but it does show this kind of spirit, you know, the spiritual background of healthcare practices and nurses as nurses are nuns, nurses are in wimples. That's why nurses had that uniform until quite recently because the Christian uh, ethos and the actual fact that hospitals were owned by and run by Christian groups had been the case. Notice also the gender relations, of course, with the men in the powerful standing positions and the women in the caring nursing positions. Now, what happens is that this, this, this system with, uh, of, of, of Christian professionals and also a lot of volunteers, you know, every parish had a team of parish visitors and other carers. This was replaced in Britain after the end of the Second World War partly because of the Second World War and the sense they wanted to do something better for returning heroes and wanted to have a more equal society. It was replaced, or rather a lot of it was taken over by, co-opted into the welfare state, the welfare project, not just in Britain, but in uh, many other countries in the West as well. In Quebec, I love this, it's called l'état de providence. So it just echoes, you know, it's, it's providence, it's cradle to grave care. So it takes over the church used to provide cradle to grave care. And now it's the state through the welfare project that will provide that same level of care. And don't forget that in this country, the architects of it, a lot of the main theorists of it were Christians like Harold Macmillan, the Archbishop of the time, William Temple, William Beveridge himself and Richard Tawney, who I'll come back to. And a bishop at the time called the welfare state an expression at the national level of the humanitarian work of the church. Now I'm laboring this point because I think it explains why um, it had legitimacy from the very start. You know, we transferred, you know, it, it, these were recognized values, things that people already were familiar with and cared. So the NHS took the stamp of the church. The GP became the local vicar, similar sort of paternalistic caring figure as you can see in this lovely picture. And the nurses were like the Sunday school teachers, the old Christian carers, and these roles were just in continuity, but now given uh, a more secular uh, frame. So I've just put down those, uh, you know, the way in which, even though these continuities, there were also these interesting differences with the health service being seen as advancing on these things in these ways, from religion to science, and from charity to greater equality of care and so on. And here's Richard Titmus again, this great social um, policy theorist. And he said, blood donation replaces the Christian Eucharist because it's real blood, not just symbolic blood. So back to this, which values now does the NHS stand for? Well, the, the rainbow is really significant in answering these questions. I'm suggesting that earlier on, it was Christian sacrifice and care, but now we've also got a rainbow, why? Here's where it started, the gay community of San Francisco. It spread to this country in gay pride. 
but it stand, now it's outside schools. It stands for diversity, respecting the unique worth of every individual. So I think from these symbols, we can see that the values that the NHS today holds together for us, holds up for us, uh, that makes it such a kind of sacred repository, a quasi-religion, are, as it always was the case from its beginning, equal, in access, equal access to everybody who needs care. But now we've added to that the rainbow. It's not just equality, it's also each unique individual will be cared for, patient-centered care. Then there's the value of care, and I think we're a bit ambivalent about that. It's a very traditional Christian value from charity, um, but we don't spend as much on it. We don't care about it as much. We've had terrible tragedies under COVID for care. Uh, it comes a bit second class. And then don't forget also the National Health, the national institution, the clues in the name, National Health Service. So it's not just diffuse values. We like to think that these are distinctive values for us in this country. And that can be Britain, or it can be devolved down. So you have the Scottish Health Service and the English and Welsh. But in, in any case, it can be any of these. It reinforces people's sense that this is what we stand for as a country. These are actually the things that make us proud. Bringing in market values, mm, not as effective as it People have tried to do it since Thatcher, not all that popular. And we've just seen a big rollback in that set of values. Governments taking control. Will the way politicians have appropriated these values? They see, the, they see how powerful this sacredness is. Will they ruin it <laughs> when they try and take it over? But to sum up finally um, with another great sociologist, this is entirely what the that some of you will know the work of Emil Durkheim, what he said, societies, he said, become cohesive, hold together because they hold up in a symbol and with everyday rituals like the clap, what really matters to them, what are their deepest values? And that creates a shared collective consciousness in which uh, even if it's not the real reality, we hold up a better image of who we are. Final caveat, it comes with some dangers. You can get very uncritical. You can turn a blind eye to the scandals. Things like Harold Shipman happen because no one wants to believe it. You can get politicians taking advantage. It can be so heavy to carry that weight of being idealized if you're somebody working in the health services. And of course the NHS can never do everything that religion can and it can't give the answers around death, suffering and injustice that different religions have done. So thank you very much for listening. I hope uh, some of you are persuaded by my argument and I look forward to the discussion. Linda, thank you very much indeed. One thing that's always guaranteed is you make me think of things in a way that I hadn't thought about them before. So it's, it's always such a pleasure. Um, my thanks on behalf of everybody here to Rachel and to Claire and to Linda for, for what I think have been incredible presentations.